this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and today we have a, a wonderful, rollicking read. It is called Blood Aces. Anything that begins with that title has got to be a great read, I think. Blood Aces, The Wild Ride of Benny Binion, the Texas gangster who created Vegas Poker by uh, Doug Swanson. Now, this book gets a, a lot of praise from uh, many different quarters in the press world, uh, one that I particularly like from the Wall Street Journal says it's a slam-bang thrill ride of a biography. Swanson writes with a pulp fiction swagger. I love that. Just right for his story's cutthroat anti-hero. Good morning, Doug. How are you? Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm great. Uh, you must really like reviews like that. Yeah, guy's a genius, huh? <laughs> that, them, that man knows what he's talking about. <laughs> well, and there's a lot of others, uh, you know, like that. Uh, I like the Daily Beast uh, reads like the best kind of crime drama where you find yourself rooting for the bad guy. Uh, and and I thought of Pulp Fiction, too, when I was reading this. I said, yeah, this is this would be, we need Tarantino to do this. This would be a great film. Yeah, I, I'm hoping it is a great <laughs> film. It's, it's been optioned, but... Uh, uh, those things, you know, move very slowly and mysteriously. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Well, I'll tell you, I I consider myself fairly knowledgeable about textology, and uh, tell you the truth, I had never heard of this guy, and I don't know why uh, he's not better known. I'm not too many, or wasn't too many uh, levels removed from that than you. I, when I started the book, all I really knew about him was that he had. Uh, begun the World Series of Poker, and that he had been a, a, a crime figure in Dallas mm-hmm. back in the 1930s and 1940s, mm-hmm. and that he ran the Horseshoe Casino. I knew little more about him than that. I, I thought, I'm just going to write a book about the Texan who started the World Series of Poker because no one else has written this book. Uh-huh. Once I got into it, I, I found that he was a far more interesting character than I had uh, originally known, and had a terrific story to his life. So I was delighted once I got in and started digging around and doing the research. I, I it was like I fell down a uh, an elevator shaft into this <laughs> gold mine. And then you got protective of your sources. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the funny thing. I, all this stuff has been sitting out there for years. The uh-huh. FBI records, which were uh, instrumental in, in the research, uh, which were a big part of my research, they've been sitting around for years and years just waiting for someone to request them. Uh, a lot of the Dallas police records had been uh, pertinent to Binion, uh-huh. had been sitting in a file down at the Texas Rangers Museum in Waco, untouched. Really? Uh, so it, it's all been uh-huh. there. It's I mean, it's all out there. It's just you know, it's someone finally had to come along and ask for them. So a testimony to just good digging on your part. Yeah, or luck. I don't know. <laughs> you, know you, you just you you stumble around and you stumble over stuff. Yeah. Well, tell us how you uh, you know when you first started doing this research. At what point did you say, "Wow, this is a fascinating character"? I think it was. Shortly after I got the FBI records, that, that the FBI had been after him for years, and chased him and chased him and chased him. And deep in the FBI records, I found some memos uh, that were written by J. Edgar Hoover's uh, first assistant, mm-hmm. who would go to a meeting at the attorney general's office every week in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. And at these meetings, they talked about many things, fascinating figures like Joseph McCarthy and Richard Nixon. But they also talked about Benny Minion and how they were pursuing Benny Minion for tax evasion. And it became clear from the reports on these meetings that, that the effort to get Binion for tax evasion went all the way to the White House, all the way to Harry Truman. Oh my goodness. And I was stunned uh-huh. to, to find this. And I, at that point, I realized, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I might have a pretty good story here. So they were doing uh, an Al Capone on him. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And what had happened was in, in Truman's, uh, what was then called the Bureau of Internal Revenue, had undergone a tremendous scandal related to bribes and shakedowns. So Truman and the Attorney General and J. Edgar Hoover uh, wanted to show that they had cleaned up the Bureau and that they were going after some high-profile targets and were really putting people away. That's one of the reasons they, they went after Benny Binion and, and some others. So Binion uh, was born in Texas and grew up in Texas, right? 
That's correct. He was born in Pilot Grove up in uh, Grayson County in North Texas near Sherman, Denison. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when he was very young, his father took him out on the road. His father was a horse trader. He never really uh, got any schooling. Uh, he never learned to read or write, never learned how to do multiplication. But he did learn how to trade horses at an early age. And then he fell in with some roving gamblers mm-hmm. would go from town to town. And uh, he learned how to run a gambling operation that way. Uh, before he even was a teenager, he, he learned how to how to run a gambling operation. So that that was his schooling. That was his education. I, I was thinking, as you said that, that uh, it used to be when I was growing up and I would hear old, old people compliment uh, someone, they would say, he's quite a horse trader. You know, it yeah. used to be yeah. high praise. <laughs> and there was a little bit of, uh, of maliciousness involved in some of these things. They yeah. would take a horse, for example, that was a little too sluggish, They would, yeah. and they wanted to liven it up a little bit. They'd put a pebble in its ear so it started jumping around <laughs> and, and you know, seem a little more lively. You know, the same thing, same way used car sales. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> they do it today. The used car dealer of their time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, so Binion uh, learns gambling, and uh, where does he go from there? He went to El Paso uh, during Prohibition and became a bootlegger. And El Paso was one of the great gateways for drugs and booze coming into the United mm-hmm. States back then. Mm-hmm. And he started his bootlegging operation there, came to Dallas in the early 1920s and uh, ran a bootlegging operation in Dallas, then got into the numbers business where he would sell uh, illicit lottery tickets, and then got into the dice business. And that's where he really made his name. That's where he started his uh, his racketeering operation. And eventually, in the, in the late 1930s, pretty much controlled uh, the dice operations all around Dallas. They were in every downtown hotel and in clubs all over the place. Uh, it was technically illegal, mm-hmm. but uh, Binion bribed all the uh, cops and the city fathers and the other authorities, and so he operated with impunity mm-hmm. around Dallas from 1936 to 1946, and that's where he really, uh, where his operation really coalesced, and he, and he began putting together this powerful uh, group, powerful operation that he had. So he was, uh, I guess, the, the head mafioso in Dallas, uh, in a sense. Yeah, we, my friends and I used to joke that when I was writing this book that they were mobsters in cowboy hats, and, <laughs> and actually they were. They were they were a bunch of good old boys running this operation, and uh, you know if you got in their way, you ended up dead, mm-hmm. and uh, that's just the way it worked. We have this image now of Dallas as this very conservative, buttoned-down, business-like place. Uh, back then, it was wild. They were having shootouts in broad daylight downtown and trying to blow each other up with car bombs. Uh, it was just a crazy scene. But the police looked the other way. As long as these guys were killing each other, yeah. there was not a problem. How, how did he uh, – he paid the police on what scale? He gave them a percentage or just uh, it made little uh, they, payoffs – from time to time, and just pay out. They would have they would have phony rates. They would come in and shut down his operation. Mm-hmm. He or his men would go down to the courthouse and pay the bond, mm-hmm. and then the his his operatives would be released, and they'd be back in business within hours. Mm-hmm. And this bond money was distributed among uh, the cops and the judges and all that. And Binion at one point estimated he was paying about $600,000 a year oh. on these bribes, oh. uh, which is, you know, that's a yeah. lot of money. But when yeah. you're taking in millions and millions, yeah. that's, just a, that's just the price of doing business. And that's, that's the way it worked until 1946 when uh, a reform movement came in, a reform sheriff mm-hmm. and a reform district attorney, and uh, Binion had to leave town. But the reform sheriff was not as clean as he seemed, right? He just aligned himself right. with the other with the other side. Exactly. Mm-hmm. He was a reform sheriff in name only. Yeah, he was. <laughs> he he aligned himself. He aligned himself with Binion's rival, uh-huh. Herbert Noble, uh-huh. whom uh, Binion's uh, men had been trying to kill for years and years mm-hmm. and years, quite unsuccessfully. They would uh, they'd wound him here and there, or they would kill his wife accidentally, uh-huh. uh, but they kept missing him. And this uh, drove per, poor Herbert Noble insane. He uh, had a bunch of chihuahuas and peacocks patrolling his house oh. because uh, he thought they would uh, start squawking or barking if intruders came. Uh, well, chihuahuas are guys, very good. Chihuahuas are very good guard dogs <laughs> for alerting you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> for alerting you. It worked. You. <laughs> uh, Herbert kept escaping. 
escaping these attempts, he was called the human clay pigeon here in Dallas, uh-huh. or, and the cat, because he had more than nine lives. But finally, uh, they put a bomb under his mailbox, and when he came out to get the mail one day, they blew it, and that was the end of Herbert Noble mm. on the well, 14th attempt. One of the, wow, talk about your nine-plus lives. Yeah. The, the, the scene I loved is when they chased him out, uh, when he's driving out to his ranch near Grapevine, I think, and uh, they're chasing him in the night. I mean, that's a movie scene right there. And, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it was straight out of the movies, these, these running gun battles. Uh, the, these bombs that would go off. Uh, at one point, they they shot him outside his house in Dallas, in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, but only wounded him. So he went to the hospital. He went to Methodist Hospital in Dallas, which is still a big hospital. Uh-huh. He was in his room, and a sniper stood outside the hospital firing through the room, the uh, window of his room, uh, trying to kill him. I mean, can you imagine that? And and, and today, yeah. uh, a, a sniper at a big metropolitan hospital. But that's the way it worked back then. I tell you, you got to get Tarantino to do this. This will be marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing with these with these movie deals. I mean, you sell the book, and they can do what they want. And I I hope they make it, and I hope they do a great job. Mm-hmm. But uh, I have no control over that. But isn't the aren't the movie rights uh, essentially sold by the uh, by the agent? Yeah, but uh, the, I control them. But yeah, the agent sells them. And right mm-hmm. now, uh, they've been sold to um, to Relativity, uh-huh. uh, which is a studio in uh, in Hollywood. Uh, was a well regarded studio. Unfortunately, uh, I read in the L.A. Times today they're on the verge of bankruptcy. Oh no! <laughs> so we'll see what happens to the project. I mean, they could still survive. Mm-hmm. The, this whole business of Hollywood uh, film financing makes uh, no. Vegas casinos uh, look like stable rational operations uh, it's it's crazy I remember years ago reading about uh, Art Buchwald who had uh, essentially written Coming to America which was a very popular film you know 25 years ago or so right with Eddie Murphy in it and uh, but he you know essentially he had written the script and he didn't get paid and uh, and the judge and jury agreed that it was his script and he should be paid and and they said yes well we we didn't make any money and so <laughs> so it yeah. had been out for 25 years around the world but they hadn't made any money yet <laughs> that's a common story uh, uh, that the the way they manipulate figures is uh-huh. is really mind-boggling so the only lesson i've ever taken out of it is is try to get the money up front <laughs> because the back end disappears yes, yes, in the swamp uh, they say they have their own unique um uh, uh, auditing, uh, excuse me, their own uh, unique accounting app that's just for Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so now we're going to go, uh, he gives up on, on Dallas because of the reform movement, and he goes uh, goes to Vegas. Right. That was 1946. He he loaded up his Cadillac, uh, supposedly with a million bucks in cash. He had two mm-hmm. of his henchmen with Tommy guns, and they drove out to Vegas, and he got into the casino business then. But th- back in 1946, there wasn't much to Las Vegas. There were a few casinos scattered around downtown, and there were a couple of places out on the Strip. Mm-hmm. But it was a tiny little desert town with not a whole lot going on. And Binion was one of the mobsters who showed up in this great wave of uh, gambling impresarios who came rolling into town in the late 1940s. And so, but did he buy a casino, or did he buy in, in interest in one, or what did he do? He bought interest in one, and then and got out of that, and then bought interest in another, and that didn't work. And finally, he bought uh, the uh, what was to become the Horseshoe Casino, uh, which was his landmark operation downtown Vegas. But it took a few years. He he uh, you know he messed around in Vegas for a while. He wasn't sure if he was going to stay there. He had a ranch in Montana. You know, Benny was a big cowboy. He loved horses, mm-hmm. and he thought about just going to Montana. But he decided to stay in the in the gambling business and started the horseshoe, and it soon became the gambling spot in mm-hmm. Vegas. It wasn't where you went to hear bands. You didn't go there to see Sinatra or Dean Martin or Sammy Davis Jr. or anything like that. You went there to gamble. It mm-hmm. was the hot gambling spot. So when you say that he invented Vegas poker, uh, are you saying that uh, poker, in the way we understand it, didn't exist before he arrived? 
It existed, but barely. It was, I mean, certainly there have been poker games, but as a casino operation, it was a minor afterthought. Some casinos didn't even have poker rooms. Uh. When Binion started the World Series of Poker, he didn't even have a place to put the poker table. He had to move <laughs> some of the dice tables <laughs> aside because it just wasn't a big money operation. And uh-huh. if you, it just didn't throw off the cash the way right. a dice game does or blackjack mm-hmm. does. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the casinos didn't embrace it. And Benny, when he started the World Series of Poker in 1970, he brought in just a handful of players. Now, they were big names, but it was just a handful. His whole plan was to have these guys play poker, and so he would bring in, the spectators would be drawn in to watch them, and then the spectators would go off to the tables at the horseshoe and, and lose some money. Mm-hmm. He never envisioned it would become the huge operation that it, that it has turned into. Yes. Well, today it's uh, bigger than ever, right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And now the mm-hmm. Binions no longer own it. Right. They sold it to uh, Harris, which became Caesars. Uh, but it's a, it's an international operation with thousands of players, millions of dollars in, in prize money. I mean, it is an amazing phenomenon. You can uh, watch it on ESPN. It's, uh, it's stunning when you mm-hmm. look at how far it came. Well, I suppose the, you know, obviously uh, TV and uh, miniature cameras and all that have made it much more interesting. You can, you're at the table now. Yeah, you can see what the guy's whole card is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mm-hmm. still find it less than thrilling, but uh, there are those out there who really love to watch that. And uh, it's, it's fat- fascinating to me. I'm not a good poker player, <laughs> uh, but it really is fascinating to me to watch it as a business and, and, a, and a cultural thing. I, I think for some people, like any sport, it's the nuances that they get um, they get attracted to. Like people are really into baseball. Yeah. They're, they're really into the nuances of the sport. And uh, I think poker is uh, similar. I'm like you. I'm not particularly particularly good at it, but people who love it, uh, I think, are focused on the the glances, the ticks, the movement of the hands, you know, all, sure. all, all of that. But you look at it now and it's these guys wearing hoodies and I know. sunglasses, <laughs> yeah. and they're, they're almost anonymous. You know, back then, back when they first started, when when Binion brought them into the horseshoe, these were the superstars of poker. There's, you know, Doyle Brunson and and uh, Amarillo Slim, and, and those those guys, that was like bringing in Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig mm-hmm. and uh, Reggie Jackson and all of those uh these were just the big, big names. Now, they had been operating really in secret because everywhere else in the country, poker was illegal. But mm. uh, these were the superstars that he brought in. How did Binion get along with um, all the Chicago mobster groups that were there? Well, in Dallas, he he faced some competition, but he fortunately, fortunately for him owned the sheriff's department here. So anytime anybody from Chicago would come in, the, the sheriff's people would put them in a car and take them out to the county line and say, get out of town. Mm-hmm. So that's where he did it here here, here in Vegas. So there was some mutual respect, and I think they, they let each other operate. Binion didn't try to get in on their turf, and in and, and many ways they didn't try to muscle in on his. Uh, they, they coexisted, and I think there was a sort of a mutual non-aggression pact going on there. So while there was a little bit of friction, uh, there wasn't much because they weren't really interested in the same things. Binion had no uh, desire to expand the horseshoe. He was happy doing that. Uh, so he wasn't going to go out on the strip. He wasn't going to try to uh, open other casinos. So they let him have his operation, and he stayed out of their business by and large. One line I like that you, you have in the book um, somewhat early on is you talked about the, the way he raised his children. He wasn't uh, overly... Uh, he wasn't a great disciplinarian except for when they mistreated horses. That was his, his right. big faux pas for big faux pas for him was mistreating horses. And they couldn't talk about horses at dinner because that's when the arguments would break out. I mean, that's what they were all passionate about was horses. That's not all of them, but many of them. And that that was very funny to me. But Binion was a family man. He he uh, was home for dinner many nights. Uh, he doted on his children. He had five children. Two of them, it turned out, had uh, very bad drug problems and, and died either as a result of that or related to that. Mm-hmm. But three of them, uh, three of the children survived him. He was married for many, many years to the same woman. Uh, so he was, you know, he had a, he had a family and he, and he uh, devoted himself in many ways to his family. Was he friends uh, with any of the great oil barons there in, in Dallas? Did he have any connections to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if friends would be a, a good term, but for example, H. L. Hunt uh-huh. 
He used to come to his Dallas uh, casinos and gamble, uh, and and a lot of the other big oil guys. But Benny liked the oil guys, uh, and for a reason that's pretty easy to understand. They had money, yeah, and they were already in the gambling business. I mean, the oil business is a gambling yeah. business, <laughs> and you know these guys when they when they weren't gambling on uh, gushers, they liked to go to the table. So he yeah. really loved having these uh, these men around. Yeah, I remember reading that uh, Hunt. Um, he loved to gamble. He had card games at his house all the other uh, all the time, and that he and the other oil barons would get together, and sometimes the oil leases would uh, be thrown in the pot. Right, uh, right. Well, it's just an extension of their profession, really. Yeah. yeah. So this. Uh, so what happened to Binion? Did the did the feds ever get him? They got him for income tax evasion mm-hmm. after uh, Harry Truman and J. Edgar Hoover came after him. They put him in Leavenworth for a few years, and. Uh, He got out. He had lost control of his casino while he was in Leavenworth to some of the mobsters, but he regained control. And that's when his operation really took off in the late 1950s and 1960s. So it was quite a comeback Mm -hmm. for him, uh, and he managed it really well. And he began to, while operating this casino, uh, he began to give away lots of money to philanthropic causes in Las Vegas and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So he became this uh, civic pillar uh-huh. in Las Vegas, this beloved figure in the community, in part because uh, he gave away so much money, mm-hmm. in part because he was so approachable. People really liked, liked him. him. And at the end of his life, he was uh, beloved uh-huh. in town. He still is. I mean, you can mm-hmm. still go out to Las Vegas and find people who will tell you how much they loved Benny Binion. Mm-hmm. Loved or feared, yeah. loved uh-huh. and feared. Well, he's, so he went straight in a way. In a way, mm-hmm. uh, he became, in his later years, after being pursued by the FBI, he became an FBI informant, mm-hmm. which uh, was another big surprise to me. Mm-hmm. That had not been uh, published before, but I found that in, in the records, and it's clear that uh, you can see J. Edgar Hoover signing off on that. And what Hoover wanted Benyon to do was provide him information on uh, mob skimming of casino revenue. I don't think Benny ever gave him any good information. I think Benny used that as a way to keep his uh, eyes on the FBI. That was pretty typical Binion behavior to mm-hmm. uh, put an arm around his adversaries and, and uh, make it appear that they were controlling him when really he was controlling them. Very possible. I remember when uh, they shot Noble and uh, you know, Noble's in the hospital and the, the cops came to ask him who shot him. He wouldn't tell him. It was kind of like yeah. against the rules, you know. I can't, I can't uh, snitch on my fellow mobsters. <laughs> oh, exactly. And then the cops went out to to Vegas to try to talk to Benny, and Benny wouldn't tell him anything. And he said, oh, you know, you're going to spend the night here. Let me, let me uh, send you out on the town." So he sends him out of the town with uh, with a guy who works at the sheriff's office there in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is a guy who's been taking payments under the table from <laughs> Benny for years and years and years. And he takes him out to all. He takes this Dallas cop and this Texas Ranger out to all these mob run run casinos in Vegas and shows them a great time. Mm-hmm. And they come back to Dallas. With with nothing in the way of a criminal <laughs> investigation, but they had a great time in Vegas. Yeah, that's just the way he operated. I mean, he really knew how to treat people. I'm sure that what happened in Vegas stayed in Vegas, even for them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, his, his motto was uh, treat the little people like big people, and he, he treated everybody the same, uh, which is really well, unless you were an enemy, and uh, then he didn't he didn't treat you so well. And he could be brutal. Well, one of the things your reviewer, yeah. many of the reviewers have said that it, you know it's uh, here's a guy who who's brutal, but he's hard not to like. You know, the, he was very likable. Apparently, mm-hmm. I I only talked to him on the phone once. I never met him in person, but he he was quite congenial. And again, it didn't matter who you were. You could be the most powerful politician mm-hmm. in, in Nevada, or you could be a guy who just came off the farm in somewhere in a little town in Texas, and you happen to be visiting Las Vegas. He treats you just the same. You know, mm-hmm. he 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 was at heart a, a poor boy who came up from nowhere, and he remembered that. Mm-hmm. He never forgot that, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, he just he just had that touch. That was part of his genius. And would you say that uh, his early you know kind of travels with his father and horse trading and all that did did that connect him to people in, in ways that stayed with him his whole life? Oh, I think so. I think he learned how to read people. As I said, he didn't he didn't know how to read or write, but he had this great native intelligence. Mm-hmm. And I was I was uh, watching a videotape of him once. He was being interviewed. 
And the look on his face was really striking to me. It was inviting, but at the same time, you could see he was sizing his interviewer up. And I mm-hmm. think that's what Benyon did with everyone. He he made it appear that he was being very genial, but he was he was calculating the odds on everyone he met. Uh, that's that was another one of his strengths. He knew whether the person was friendly or not. He knew whether he could use that person or not. But he also knew how to treat you, where uh, you felt like you'd. Uh, You've just been granted an audience with the king, and the, and the king uh, <laughs> treated you like just another pal. Uh-huh. So uh, have you, in doing all this research and writing this book, has it changed your approach to life in any way? My approach to life? Your personal uh, approach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh-huh. I had such a good time writing this book that uh, – Usually, I, I, this is my sixth book, and usually after I finish a book, I say, I'm never writing another book, because <laughs> uh, that was so hard and so unrewarding. Uh-huh. But I had so much fun with this one, and he is such a great character, uh, and it was just a, an unusual delight to research and write that I've immediately plunged into another book, which I'm, I'm sure I'll regret. So it changed my life in that way a little bit, uh, but it also gave me an appreciation for someone who could uh, lead a life as his, where he had to do all these terrible things and order so many people killed, or he didn't have to, but he did, mm-hmm. had so many unsavory things in his life, yet, uh, at the same time, conducted himself in such a way that uh, 25 years after his death, people are still speaking of him in, in loving reverential loyal tones i mean that's that's a pretty remarkable achievement and i'm not saying i'm i'm going to model my life after benny minion by, by oh, any right, measure. Right. but but that's something to think about to me you know what after you're gone away what what are people going to say about you how do you treat them and that, he was really big on treating people well part of it was that was just business but part of it was that that was his nature and i think that's that has stayed with me Thank you, Doug. I'm sorry we're, we're out of time. We have to run. But uh, let me say again, the book, ladies and gentlemen, is Blood Aces, The Wild Ride of Benny Binion, the Texas gangster who created Vegas poker. It is a wonderful read. I think uh, the Wall Street Journal is correct when they said it's like reading uh, Pulp Fiction. It's like, uh, you know, a movie. And it, it reads like that. I like what uh, you may know. Uh, S.C. Gwynn, who's uh, famous for Empire of the Summer Moon, he said simply, it's entertaining as hell. So pick it up. It's a wonderful read. For Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. Good books.